Hi everyone, welcome back to Fire and Film, and this is the first part of this year's Manif coverage, and I am delighted to have been joined by Karen Newman, who is one of the producers of the film Love Without Walls. Uh, thanks for joining us, Karen. You're very welcome. And uh, I basically, and I've, I've kind of prepped you on this as well, it's a bit of a weird one in that I've not seen the film, so usually I might have seen the film and then talked to people and all that kind of stuff, so this is an interesting one, um, because... And I think to be fair, this might be the better way of doing it. Uh, I'm going to go along to the premiere on Sunday as part of as part of Manif. Um, so I've got a couple of questions for you just to talk about the film. Um, and I suppose the awkward thing to do is to ask you to tell us a little bit about the film. Yep, I can do that. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. I can say that even though you haven't, <laughs> you haven't seen it. Um, so it's a music romantic drama. And um, a lot of original music by the lead actor, singer songwriter Niall McNamee. Um, it's a little bit like the film Once, but a lot better, if I'm allowed to say that. Um, and it's about two a married young couple, um, Sophie and Paul, and it's set just after the pandemic, um, which I suppose is what we're in now. And this young couple has struggled. They've been priced out of London. They can't afford their rent. Um, so they get made homeless. So they sofa surf and they go and stay with friends, but that that doesn't really work out. No one really wants them to sleep on the sofa. So they end up in, in their car and then the car gets towed away and basically everything just spirals for them. And they both end up in quite a, a not to give anything away, but quite a dark, dodgy sort of situation. And it's really, it's a beautiful film. It's it's romantic. I know it didn't, didn't sound like that from my description, but it's a, it is a romantic story. Um, with beautiful original music, um, which we're hoping will do very well for Niall as well, because he's trying to la launch an album. <laughs> OK. Um, so I noticed that this was written and directed by Jane Gull, who people may know from My Feral Heart that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, how did you and Jane meet in order for the film to get off the ground? Um, Jane and I met at a party a few years ago when I didn't want to go and she didn't want to go. But our respective other halves both said, just go, speak to one person, have one drink. And we were each other's one person, although it was a lot more than one drink. <laughs> um, and we were actually working on another project just before lockdown, which kind of fell apart because of the pandemic. We couldn't shoot. The financing kind of disappeared. So Jane had this in her bottom drawer and it had been something she'd been revisiting over time. And she's kind of sort of stood it across my um, patio table and was like, read that. And I read it, and I thought it's absolutely brilliant. She's got such a unique voice as a filmmaker. This is such her strong style. And with the added elements of music, it's just a fantastic film. Perfect. So I, I'm actually speaking to Niall, um, as I've only mentioned, after after we finished speaking. Uh, and I'm keen to talk to him about his music and how mm. it fits into the film. But from your perspective, what does Niall's music add to the film? Um, we recorded it all live on set, which we were told um, by numerous people, don't do that, but we did. Um, so it's very, it's got a very acoustic feel and a lot of the emotions, you know, are expressed through the music and it travel, it carries the story really beautifully. Um, I, he will tell you more about how it fits in to the journey of his character, but essentially his character is a, is a, you know, a struggling musician who's trying to make it. So the whole concept is he's, you know, he goes and he tries to gig and it doesn't work and all of that sort of stuff happens to him. So it's a bit, it's a very important element. Good, good. Um, I just out of interest, not a question that I've written down. What would you say were the sort of challenges if there were any of recorded in this music life? Um, well, we filmed in South End under the under the bridge. I don't know whether anybody knows South End, where all the trains go past. So we were literally recording bits whilst in gaps before the train like zoomed across. So there was a lot of kind of you know this obviously recording sound is really problematic sometimes when you're on location. But we had a really good um, sound recordist who's had a background in music. So he, with all his equipment, he was able to kind of hone in on the sound, and we managed to get all of it without needing to clean it up, which was quite, which is quite something. Really. All right, interesting. Because yeah. I've I've done student films before, and I feel like everything needs a bit of a, a tidy <laughs> and things like that. So, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I suppose the sort of selling point, the reason of the podcast, the reason of this that this interview that we're doing is to sort of try and get people out to Manif and to go and watch the film. So for anyone who's listening and um, who's seen the film schedule um, and is currently trying to figure out what it is that they want to go and see, why do you think they should pick Love Without Walls, other than the fact that it's amazing? <laughs> because it's a film of the times. Um, it, it makes you think. 
it challenges your perception of what people are going through at the moment um if you love a love story it's all in there the music's absolutely fantastic i mean there really is something in there for everybody we've got other bands that that perform as well so it's a it's a lovely mixture and it really is one of those films that that kind of stays with you and you talk nice. about you talk about afterwards yeah. Because I mentioned that you know I've been looking at um, Manif for the past couple of years, and I've been I've been and there and stuff like that. And last year um, there was a film called Mindset, um, which won Best UK Feature, um, okay. and that was a really sort of it felt small, but at the same time it was trying to do bigger things. It was trying to achieve bigger things, and it was having a bit of a commentary and everything. Um, and I, I feel like just from watching the trailer for whatever that was, I feel like that is essentially what I'm going to get from it. In that it's it feels small, but the message and the the just the, the the sort of commentary on homelessness, I think, and how yeah. everyone's dealing coming out of a pandemic, like you say. Um, I think I'm I'm really looking forward to going and seeing it. Um, from a teaching standpoint, um, and I'd, I'd be, it'd be remiss of me to do this, and it feels a bit daft, but uh, this week is National Careers Week, um, right. as we record this, and for my students because I teach film studies. Um, and you know, we sort of we watch the credits of films and they go, All right, so that person wrote it, that person directed it. What does the director do? And then they go, oh, That person produced it. What does a producer do? Could you answer the question of what a producer does? <laughs> How long is this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in, in a nutshell, it's taking an idea, uh, a story right through from literally the conception of the idea through the writing process, the development process, the packaging, by that I mean the finance, the cast, all those audience elements. We find an audience, we work out where the film sits in the market, we talk to sales agents um, and potential distributors to see you know, where it will go, what level of cast we can get for the budget. We budget it, we schedule it. Um, and then when all that's done, we go gray over production, praying to God that everything goes well. And then it's into post, we manage that, we oversee all the post, and then it's into sort of distribution land and selling it but you kind of never really get rid of the film because you're always doing something either legally on it or or something's happening so it's like having a child that kind of just goes through you know gr grows up and then maybe sort of leaves for university and occasionally pops back with its washing <laughs> you might not hear for a while but something might come up and you all right i've got to deal with you again <laughs> yeah, so it's, a lot of, it's a lot of kind of uh, creative legal challenges it's it's juggling it's juggling lots of sometimes people are more creative producers sometimes they're more finance background but a lot of us are kind of just sort of in the middle trying to juggle both yeah because have you got a plan for the, i suppose the rest of the year past manif because obviously this is the world premiere on sunday yeah so this is the first time that people are getting to see it yeah. but then i would imagine that you're hither and everywhere and all the different festivals well, we're actually we're actually doing us we're releasing it theatrically in June, so um, not quite sure exactly how that's going to look at the moment. So I can't mm -hmm. tell anybody where they're going to be able to see it. But we're doing a theatrical release, and then obviously all, all the non theatrical releases will come after that. And there are a few festivals um, that will pop up on route as well, of which unfortunately I can't say anything because we haven't either haven't heard back or we're not allowed to announce. Oh, interesting. <laughs> but either <laughs> yeah. way, <laughs> yeah. Because I think the, the the sort of landscape at the minute in terms of releasing is so wide and varied in that the the sort of old old school theatrical release I think is still a sort of I don't know like a like a aiming point I would say yeah whereas I think a lot of things are finding lives on streaming services and sort of even just like digital download through iTunes and things like that so I can imagine that um, especially for a film like this a a theatrical release is going to do it the world of good. Especially yeah. in like places like I don't know if you've ever been to home in Manchester. Yes, so I have. That's really yeah. you know a really a really nice cinema and really champions these kind of small films. Um, so I think hopefully you know you're going to get a lot from that theatrical release. Um, in terms of you personally, what is next for you? Have you got anything else lined up? Or... Yeah, we've got. Um, I'm developing uh three projects with Jane. Um, so very different, and then I've got a couple of other things sort of coming up. Um, the one, the project that Jade and I had dropped before COVID, we are revisiting and picking it up. So we're as soon as we've got Manchester kind of out of the way, we're going to start looking at that again. And was Manchester a sort of? Uh, I, I suppose my question is, why did you pick Manchester for your premiere? Because of the music connections historically and currently. I mean, you think about all the great artists that have come from Manchester and it just felt like, especially for Niall, it just felt like the perfect place 
in the middle of the country just to go boom here we are yeah. um, and I think it would I think you know we we kind of toyed with London and we thought yeah okay that that would be cool too but Manchester has such prestige with regards to music that it just felt like the perfect place nice okay um that's it from me uh so thank you very much for that um and uh, you can head over to Manif uh the Odie and Great Northern this weekend on Sunday the 12th of March at six o'clock to check out uh, whoever that was. I'll be there. Karen will be there. Um, we'll who else is going? Do you know? Um, the two stars, Shana and Niall. We've got our cinematographer, Susie, our casting director, Ben Cogan, um, and various other people coming along as well. So, yeah, it'd be quite, it'd be quite an event. Great. See you there. All right. Take care. Welcome to my humble abode. We'll Manor House Station to Gibson game. Square. Leave on left green lanes, right and right Highbury New Park, right St Paul's Road. I've got nowhere else to go. If it is a problem, it's we can fine. I just can't believe what you were paying in rent. It's almost double our mortgage. Right Wickham Street. Right Panton Street. Why you bothering, mate? Game's dead. Oh, I ain't. would want to go around and learn all those roads for you. That's why we have set names, innit? Anyway, we you want to be a rock star. Well, you know what? It's something to fall back on, ain't it? Have you got any more gigs coming up? Yeah, a couple. You want to stick to carry out, you mate? Oi! Sorry, what's going on? If it's your vehicle? Yeah. This vehicle shouldn't be on the road. Well, I'm going to fail the knowledge, so what do no we do No one fails the knowledge, I just give up. If you have up. something to fall back on, you're going to fall back on it. That's how it works. No one who's successful ever had a plan B. You're enough for me. But this isn't enough for us, is it? I was very sorry to hear about your dad. Yeah, he's top bloke. Have you got any ID? No, because we lost everything. Passport? Nope. You said it's your girlfriend. We don't have anything! Lost the paint into the mollish. Driving nights to the mollish. Cold chips with a staple diet of being homeless, I think. We are not homeless. We're just temporarily without walls. Would madam like a shower or a bath? You're another. Yeah, but I'm your nutter, ain't I? <laughs> Okay, so that was the trailer for uh, Love Without Walls. I've now been joined by uh, Niall McNamee. I think I'm saying that right. If I'm not, yeah. by all means, correct me. I'm a farrand, <laughs> so I get a farrand, farrand, all sorts. So I do apologise. <laughs> yeah, uh, you've, you've smashed it. Good. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you um, ahead of yeah. the world premiere of the film on Sunday. And um, I wanted to start, and I mentioned this to Karen, um, talking to you about China in a Box. Mm. Uh, because I went back, and for those who aren't aware, this is the single that was released in 2021, and the accompanying video. Now, I was more intrigued to figure out about what came first. But was it the idea of the film, or did the song come first? Because the video is very much a sort of backstory for these two characters, of Paul and Sophie. Yeah, well, um, so w when the when the movie came about. Um, I'd already started releasing a few songs, um, like Step by Step, which is in the movie, and that's out as well. And um, and China in a Box was kind of, uh, I, I'd written it, I, I'd already written it before the before I knew the movie even existed. And uh, and uh, I spoke to Karen and Jane about about what songs might fit in the movie, and they said they wanted a particular song about being in love and, and caring for someone during hard times. And they wanted me to write one, which was, which was grand. Uh, but then I said, listen, I'm, I'm releasing China in a box, this song in a month or two. Um, do you want to have a listen to this and maybe have a look at the lyrics and stuff? And, uh, and they kind of said it was perfect. So then, then we started working immediately on a music video for it uh, before we, uh, before we even did the movie, I think COVID got involved as well because we were, supposed to be started filming uh, and it got cut back but they I, they wanted to start working on something and actually the music video was was a great uh almost like a a prequel to the movie in, mm -hmm. in a sense because we needed a day where as often films do where you go out and get pictures of your life before it to be around your house and 
like your wedding day and stuff. So it kind of really worked out that way. Yeah. Interesting. So you you had the you had the song and then the sort of the, this idea of a prequel. I like that idea, the idea of a prequel because um Karen mentioned that China in a box is being shown at the festival the night before. Yeah. So if anyone is, wants yeah. to go and see the short selection mm. the night before, uh, you'll get a bit of a sort of teaser, I suppose, um, of yeah. what you're gonna get in Love Without Walls. Um mm. so I'm assuming the, the intention wasn't that you were writing these songs for them to be featured in a film like this. No, because not at all. Of, of, yeah. of what we know about you, you're you know, you're a single songwriter, you've got this sort of passion for music as well as acting. And mm. I think you've naturally found something here where they both can sort of just go hand in hand a little bit. Um yeah. Karen mentioned about you um probably writing uh, did you write some songs for the film? So I wrote one song for the film. Okay. Um, uh which was called which is called The Knowledge. And that was just because um and this isn't a spoiler, but um, one of the things at the start of the movie and and, and sort of kind of shown during throughout is is that is that my character Paul um, is is grieving his 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 father who's recently passed passed away, um, and and you know my father my father's very much alive, which sounds like a weird brag, uh, but it's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so and and part of that is. Um, is that his dad did so much for him, and he and he and he kind of drove a black cab around London and worked on building sites and and did everything to to allow his son to and his daughter uh, to to kind of have an all right life. And I think that's why part of why my character Paul is is interested in in driving a driving a black cab as well. So it the song needed to be more specifically about that so you know i was learning the knowledge you know the thing you have to learn to drive a black cab and um and uh and it just fit well into a song and my my dad always worked in the building sites he was a bricky and and uh and i have a lot of love and respect for him so it kind of it was easy enough um uh to, to kind of get that on board and then add in in the black cab stuff but uh yeah yeah is it was it strange writing? It sounds like you had to write a, a song as a character then. Yeah, it was it was strange, and but to be fair, it came at a good time in the sense that I was never I've ne- never before the lockdown had I ever written a song, uh, th- th- where I went right. I'm going to sit down and write some songs now. Mm. It'd always be like, you know, when I was single or whatever, or <laughs> like. <laughs> in a heartbreak situation or if I just got really drunk or I don't know, like it, it was me like kind of coming back to my bedroom where my guitar was after getting into some shenanigans. So, which was a good and bad thing because I, I wonder sometimes was it a bit chicken and egg? Sometimes I get myself in situations and I'd be going, what would I be getting into this if I wasn't a songwriter? Not on purpose, but maybe subconsciously. But during lockdown, I was locked locked down in the middle of the countryside with my girlfriend, and I thought, you know, if we have an argument and I write a song about it, she's going to know it's about her. <laughs> so, you know, and also, like, how many songs can you write about uh, not doing the dishes or or leaving the shower thing open so the water drips? Like, do you know what I mean? It's not. Yeah. It's not. It doesn't make good drama. So, um, so I'd already decided. I was like, right, I've got all the time in the world to write songs now. So I do need to try and sit down and write songs without it being about something that immediately has just happened i need to dig deep so i was at that point but i was writing from the point of view of a character but after i'd used the little things that linked up with and i don't like thinking about writing songs like this because normally i do just it happens in three minutes normally a song and it's kind of there but once i got in the bits that were specifically about the father in the movie the big gaps that were left were easy to fill with my own father and my grandfather and all that sort of stuff. Um, um, lo- you know, there's there's loads of bits about me dad. You know, managing my football team when I was growing up, and 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 even though we weren't religious or he wasn't, uh, it's taking me into church in my shin pads before a football match on a Sunday. I think more because he thought if we didn't, we might lose. So like, <laughs> you, know, you know, so yeah, it was it was it was all right enough. I was surprised that. I love the song, The Knowledge. Sorry, this is a long story. I love the song, The Knowledge. And I'm really surprised that I do because I always had the worry that because I'd written it in a different way to all of my other songs, that there'd always be a bit of me going, 
yeah, but that's not, you know that that's not actually, that's not you, is it? But actually, right, okay. It's one of, one of my more favourite songs, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm assuming there are other songs that you'd already written that have found their way into the film then? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all the other ones were, were songs that already existed um, and uh, and I've been playing for a while and, and I've kind of recorded them now and I'm going to, I'm bringing out an album around the time of the theatrical release in June, or at least I'll start releasing some of the songs off it as singles. Um, um, so yeah, it was it was kind of it was it was, you know, step by step in China in a box, which are two major songs from the movie are already released. So um, the album's going to have loads of songs that aren't on the movie. There's a song I've written called "Love Without Walls," which I wrote during filming the movie, but okay. isn't in it. It's mm. kind of like a summation of the whole thing and um, which i think is nice um and very much written on a kind of me and shana who plays uh the lead uh my plays my wife in it uh, you know we're very protective over each other so we had quite a bond and so it was quite easy to write a song called love without walls just about that because it was stressful and tiring and yeah it was amazing it was great crack but we were both i think felt a bit um uh, uh what's the word um a bit Oh God, it's gone at my head. A bit fragile, <laughs> not fragile, but a bit um, vulnerable, maybe. Vulnerable, vulnerable is the word. <laughs> um, because it was all on our shoulders and stuff. And Jane and Karen were amazing, but we minded each other, and that was kind of, I think, yeah. that's kind of what the movie's about, really. Because you know. what I understood from my conversation with Karen is that this was an idea that Jane, the director, had had for a while, mm. and she sort of just pulled it out one day and said to Karen. I'm interested in doing this. And it was always sort of infected with music or influenced by music and things like that. So whereabouts mm. in the sort of process, did you come on board? Did you sort of audition or anything like that? Or did they approach you? Because you so, so, so I, um, the first I heard of the movie was, uh, was just as lockdown had finished or not as it is, as we come out of the first one. Do you remember the summer when we were starting? We, yeah, all we the could sit in help, pubs. To, uh, help out to eat out things, whatever. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was, uh, I'd obviously not gigged in months because of because of it, but um, I got asked to go and play in a, a pub called Feely's in Clapham, just like in the corner. Mm. And uh, and because I hadn't done a gig for ages, I just mentioned to a few mates of mine, I said, oh, I'm going to be in London and I'm going to be playing this gig in the corner of a pub. And it's a proper... Salt and uh, salt and sawdust. It's not salt, is it? Spit and sawdust. <laughs> Spit and sawdust. Um, hub. I love it, and uh, and it ended up like so many, so many people showed up to the pub. People I've not seen in ages, and and it was a great night. And then a woman came up to me, and I thought she was a copper because the place had got kind of busy, and they couldn't control how many people were in there because it wasn't normally that busy. They thought it'd be fine. And uh, she said, oh, I've, this was late. And then I added a few points and she was like, listen, I've written the script. And, uh, you know, she said this, <laughs> there's something on the lines of, of this part would be, I think you're made to play this role. You'd be perfect for this role. And I said, oh, my God, what's it about? And she said, a failed singer songwriter. And I was <laughs> like, OK, uh, how will I get into that headspace? I wonder. Um, and I uh, um, but part of me was also thinking, as you do to a, at a certain point in your life, I was kind of thinking, yeah, sure, you do. Or like, I don't know, like it was late in a pub. Uh, you it wouldn't be the first person who's gone, yeah. got a script, every script. <laughs> so, but she, it was Jane. So we got chatting and she invited me to, to basically go to this uh, place in Camden, like a little hall, a theatre place. I can't remember the name of it. Jane will kill me. But uh, and Shanna, who plays my wife, was there, and she just wanted us to run scenes together, kind of to see if we had a dynamic that worked. I know there were other musicians and singer-songwriters and actors who who had staked interest in it, a few big ones, um, and uh, and uh, and it just worked out. And and Shanna would agree with me on this. Me and Shanna are so different, uh, but opposites must attract because we got on like a house on fire straight mm. away. Um, so yeah, it was. So I kind of came in at that point. Shanna was already cast. I think they're already casting all the other roles. I think it was just this one, and I think it worked because, to a certain extent, where the movie starts with Paul, is kind of where I was. I was playing music in pubs and and uh, and trying to make it as a songwriter and 
and, and all that. Um, so it made sense. I knew that world. I remember one day, I knew the world so well. I remember busk. We had, there's a scene where we had to go and busk on the street in South End. And I had my guitar out. And Jane, I noticed, had got the camera crew to stand way back and leave a lot of space around me. And uh, and I said, so what do you want me to do? Just just play. And she went, yeah. And then like we'll just capture like people standing and watching you and, and putting money in the thing. And I said, I said, I was worried about this, Jane. I said, do you think people are going to stop and listen to me and, and like clap and give me money? And she went, yeah, of course they will. And I went, they won't. I promise you they won't. I said, I'll do it. But you're about to learn a lot about, <laughs> unless you have a big speaker and you're in Leicester Square, like I was like, and Jane couldn't believe it because she loves my music and I love yeah. my music and I have a following and, you know, I'm not bigging myself up, but I'm doing all right enough to know that some people like my music and people, I can sing well. People can like, it's not, it's not a torture to listen to me sing. But I also know that on a street, on a busy street in South End, you're not going to get people. So it was a world that I knew well. Jane couldn't believe it. You know? <laughs> it sounds like you've put, um, you brought a lot of sort of, I don't know, like real world, you know, education to the film. Well, like... it was important to me. It was important to me because because there's so many things that happen in pubs that you, because it's, it's a weird place to be in when you're the one who is working on their own at the time when everyone else is socializing. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. you just see the world in a totally different, different way. You know, the amount of times I've had to get these teeth replaced because someone's danced backwards into my microphone. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like it's insane. People are dancing oh, to no. the music and they turn around and the moment they turn around dancing, they forget that the music is coming from behind them. Um, and I've got the guitar, so I can't do anything. <laughs> and just so anyway. slowly furthering back to the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, sorry, I went on a bit there. No, no, by all means. So when you were sort of looking at the scripts and things like that, was it more of a sort of a collaboration between you and Jane of Jane Zane? Do you think you've got any songs already that might fit this bit of the film, or did you start to suggest some of your past songs? Yeah, I, I, if I remember rightly, we we had we had a few meetings, Zoom meetings, where we would go through the scripts with Shanna and me, we'd be like having a read through and then it would be like, Jane would go, oh, by the way, just here, underline that, we need the song there. Right. And and it would kind of just have to fit in. Sometimes it'd be like, it needs to be this kind of song. Sometimes it just needs to be that kind of song. And and we kind of worked it out. And I sent through a load of songs that I had to Jane and Jane and Karen were looking at them and seeing what worked. And, um, and yeah. Yeah, it, it, it kind of worked perfectly. There was a discussion for a while because I rarely get the chance to play someone that isn't Irish. I was like, I would love Paul to be um, English in this, maybe Cockney or something. And James was like, your songs are quite Irish. What would that, that wouldn't make sense. And I was like, oh yeah. It'd be like me me talking like that the whole time and then going, oh, la, da, la, la, la. <laughs> so it just wouldn't have made sense at all. Um, so yeah. Interesting, because um, I was thinking about you know the film and and the way that I spoke to Karen about how this is such a small film, but it feels like it's it's trying to achieve something much bigger. It's trying to have such a such a commentary on homelessness and how people are sort of dealing post pandemic and things like that. And what is your sort of I suppose hope for the film? What 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 do you think would be a a grand thing to happen this year? It's a big question. Um... First of all, I um, I've I've been, I've been in films and I've been in TV and stuff. But I've never been the lead of a film, and and certainly never something this uh, um specific. So I'm kind of, to be honest, happily naive in my expectations of it. Um, I would like to say the one thing I know that will happen is anyone who watches it will find it hard to look at homelessness homelessness yeah yeah in the in the same way again i don't think i quite realized how harrowing it is okay. uh, until i watched it myself and saw how upset people who i know and love came to watch it you know and even i sat there and it just it's it's amazing in that sense it doesn't pander to a um to a sadness in the way some things do you know there's no like 
Coldplay playing underneath it, and because this is a sad moment, <laughs> yeah. it's 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 built totally in real experiences and the reality of it, and and I think what I love about it is is that even though to us as the viewer it's harrowing and horrible, there's a nonchalant uh, kind of shrug from the people in the movie. Right. Because they see it every day, mm-hmm. and you realise that 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 these people you see struggling in the movie are not unique. Yeah, and in fact, for a lot of it, are are actually quite. It's quite uh, a lot. It's quite a lot of people. Um, but my hopes for the movie, I don't know. I re- I really don't know. What sort of thing do you mean? Like, do I? Well, just uh, I, I, I spoke to Karen about it, and we were talking about how the film's having a theatrical release, which I wasn't aware of. Um. Because... Neither was I till last week, but that's because I oh, wasn't right. okay, listening. There you apparently, go. <laughs> <laughs> apparently I wasn't listening. Oh, yeah, but uh, but yeah, I've sort of just yeah, I've I've doing this, and you know, this has been great in that um, the podcast started in lockdown as a response to me not being able to teach my students and me trying to get as much content to my students as possible, and then naturally sort of things just came my way of you could watch this film and you could interview this person, you could do this. And I'm, I, I really enjoy it. I really love it. And what I'm finding is I'm getting so much more from the smaller quote unquote grassroots films than I am anything bigger wise, because you know, if you, if you, if you talk about a bigger film, if you're talking Avengers, Avatar, whatever mm. it is, you're mm. quote unquote pissing into the wind. Like everyone's doing it. You, you're getting nothing mm. out of it. But whereas, mm. like a film like this, um, films that I've covered for Manif before, is it's really nice to see everyone being so reciprocal or, or receptive of interviews that you're doing, um, any sort of coverage, any sort of early reviews and things like that. So after I see the film, I'm going to review it, um, mm. and they're always the ones that I think are the most interesting. So when I was talking to Karen and she said, "Oh, we're getting a theatrical release in in June." Now I'm like thinking this has the potential of being one of those sort of I hate the word, but I'm gonna use it sleeper hits in the it's I've never heard that phrase before. You've never heard of it before? No. It's it's the idea that it doesn't get much traction, or it might be that it's a really, really good film, but because it's got a small release, not many people might sort of get wind of it. But then I think yeah. yeah, I think something like Ali and Ava that came out last year that got a lot of word of mouth around it because of the festival circuit and because of all of these other things that eventually you sort of have this huge social media traction that mm. eventually when they become available on maybe something like a streaming service, that that's mm. where it finds a new life. And I think for this film, and I think as well for your music, that mm. surely um, for you, people are going to go to this and, I think as we all do, we all hear a song in the film and we go, oh, I quite like that song. I want to go and check yeah. that out afterwards, you know, and things well, like that's, that. Well, that's that's so, why I'm, that's why I'm doing that's why I'm doing the album in a sense. Um, I would have kind of probably just done singles, but it felt like the right time. And part of me was thinking you probably shouldn't wait until you do your next movie where you play all your own songs in it. So I thought <laughs> it would <laughs> like I thought it would probably be the right time to to get get them out there um yeah yeah why you, not you're listen, touring listen. as well this year aren't you uh, i toured last year um right uh just before yeah is in i finished in november and i started it started uh kind of sporadically in, in july and then it got more and more and um uh i don't know if i will be touring this year because i um, think I, I went on your twitter and read those dates and just assumed they were this year then. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's uh it's, do you know what? I find it very difficult organising too far in advance with both music and acting because typically, and it did happen, I was promoting a tour, all, last year's tour, from about March and, right. you know, was working, you know, and I've got a few acting jobs and stuff while I was doing that. But typically, like, the week before the tour, got a part in, in something and had to end up flying back and forth to do it, which was great crack and I kind of liked the buzz of it. But there was definitely a week or two in the year where it could have happened, where I could have done it both <laughs> easily. I didn't appreciate having to leave my hometown without a pint to fly back to Crawley. Uh, but nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. No. Yeah. 
Um, I, I was going to ask you because I ended the sort of the interview with Karen in the same way about mm. what could you say to somebody who is flicking through the magazine, uh, the guide of the festival, and deciding what it is to watch. But I feel like you sort of summed it up quite nicely with the um, the idea that you've come out of this film seeing homelessness in a different light, essentially, and that mm. surely if anyone's going to get anything out of it, that would be the thing that they get out of it. Um, but I suppose as a as a bit of a sort of end point, what what do you think people should look forward to with Love Without Walls? What should they look forward to? Um, I think there's brilliant individual performances throughout. I, I think the most positive, uh, beautiful thing about the movie is me and Shana's relationship. I think our relationship is the best actor in the movie. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I yeah, think yeah. that's what that's what Shana, me and me and Shana were really quite emotional after we like giving each other a hug because it was like, oh mate, like it to see that was great. And uh it's definitely a love story in a way that you don't often see. Mm -hmm. Because the love is there. Yeah. The love is always there. You never look at those two and go well, maybe their life would be not so turbulent if they weren't together. That's what mm -hmm. I love about it. Yeah. How how often do you see a movie where the leads are a couple and actually the relationship is never the issue? I love that about the movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's very strong. Um, uh, the music is great fun. There's lots of humour in the movie. Jane's a great writer. Like well, She's excellent. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, great moments. But I... It's it's very high Daniel Blake, I would say. It's very it's, it's that that, yeah. that would be that that and once I Daniel Blake mixed with once, I'd say would be quite a fair a fair way to describe the yeah. movie. Karen mentioned once, but then she said it's better than once. And she said she thinks it's all right to say that, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anyway. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I won't be saying that because I I know Glenn a little bit. I've met him a few times <laughs> and I, I love him to bits. But uh yeah, certainly if the movie does well in Ireland, there's not really going to be many people leaving. Going, it's like it's not. It's like once. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's dark. It's darker than once. Oh, you know? interesting. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I, in the sense that I, from what I can remember of once, and I absolutely love the movie. Once is more of a commentary on the music industry mm -hmm. and the state of affairs, whereas I think this is more of a. <laughs> You know, this is more of a comment on the state state of the world, yeah. um, and how anyone can fall into 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 bad times and doesn't it much really? Um, so I'd like to think most people will leave it kind of. That's another thing about it, and maybe it's on the same thing as the homelessness thing. I do think you kind of sit there, and it does make everyone realise how how close we are to the streets. Yeah. Um. Um. Seriously, like it doesn't take much and things just go wrong a few times and then so yeah my mum and dad my, my dad is looking forward to me being in something where it's like i'm just a like the lead guy's best mate in a rom-com or something <laughs> he's starting to get really it's really harrowing for him um as long as i think yeah the next thing needs to be a rom-com certainly not shakespeare where i die early um and yeah something with a bit, a bit more light you know, it's a little bit more lighthearted, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think you know, I think as a, as a as a as an Irish lad and just as a a normal bloke, as you might call it, as many of us are. What a weird sentence. Um, uh, there's there's humour in 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 bad times as well, and that sometimes that can be the funniest, you know. So I love I love that about the movie. It's got some good funny moments. Too. Great. Uh, so once again, uh, it's having its premiere. So this is Love Without Walls having its premiere at Manif on Sunday, this coming Sunday uh, at 6pm. And I'll see you there. Mm, I'll see you there. I'll have to take it handy on the... Ireland playing Scotland just before it and I have to play music at 9 o'clock. So that's a long time. I might just have a coffee. Yeah. <laughs>